Uh, Good evening. Welcome to be here. Uh, welcome to Wheeler for this evening's panel. I apologize about the heat. I know it's kind of brutal in the room. Um, thank you for coming. I want to start by thanking a couple of the people and institutions responsible for making this event possible, uh, starting with Dean Orville Schell of the Journalism School, uh, the Office of the Chancellor, uh, and the Union of Concerned Scientists for uh, co-sponsoring this event and helping us put it together. I also want to thank Marsha Parker and Chad Heater for heroic work in helping to organize this event, uh, Anna Silvestri as well, and uh, Carrie Ching at the Journalism School. I don't know that there's ever been an historical moment where the role of science in helping us settle critical issues of policy has been more important. Some of the most crucial questions that we face today about the environment and public health, weapons policy, decisions about going to war or not, and medicine simply cannot be decided without reference to scientific research. For the first time in memory, science policy regarding stem cell research, uh, most notably, has emerged as an issue in the presidential campaign. And you can be sure we'll be hearing about it uh, during tomorrow night's debate. My own introduction to, the, to this issue came a few years ago, when in the course of my own reporting on the food industry, I began running into USDA, Department of Agriculture staff scientists, who told me they could no longer talk to reporters without getting permission. Uh, these scientists actually began returning calls to me from uh, pay phones uh, and at home at night um, and would ask to go off the record to talk about things like room and nutrition. Um, this struck me as odd, and, but I had some sense that something was afoot, but no sense of the larger pattern that might be at work here. Um, that I think I understood better earlier this year. Uh, when a group of 68 preeminent American scientists, including 20 Nobel laureates, released a statement titled, Restoring Scientific Integrity in Policymaking. The statement claimed the Bush administration had engaged in unprecedented, and I quote, manipulation of the process through which science enters into its decisions. I think the statement will be outside if you want to pick up a copy when you leave. Uh, we're very fortunate to have two of the distinguished names that signed the statement with us tonight. Kurt Gottfried and David Baltimore. Since it was released, another 5,500 scientists have signed on to it in what the London Independent, uh, the Daily, has called an unprecedented revolt against the government by American scientists. In conjunction with the scientist statement, the Union of Concerned Scientists published a report documenting dozens of cases of what it called the abuse of science in policymaking. They concluded there had been uh, a well-established pattern of suppression and distortion of scientific findings by high-ranking administration political appointees across numerous federal agencies. They concluded there had been a wide-ranging effort to manipulate the government's scientific advisory system to prevent the appearance of advice that might run counter to the administration's political agenda. And they found a pattern of imposing restrictions on what government scientists can say or write about sensitive topics, hence uh, what my staff scientists at the USDA were telling me. Our goal tonight is twofold. First, to hear from scientists as well as present and former government employees who are in a position to document from firsthand experience the suppression or distortion of science by the administration. And second, to look at this whole question of politics policy and science more analytically and critically to go beyond the, the, the cases and explore the broader questions at stake. I should point out that as a bookend to the union's reports, the Hoover Institution down the road recently issued its own volume alleging that the politicization of science is a bipartisan affair and that previous administrations have been just as guilty, if not more so, of suppressing politically inconvenient science and scientists. I should add too that Several authors of that report, as well as two representatives from the administration, White House Science Advisor John Marburger and Special Assistant uh, to Tommy Thompson at HSS, William Steiger, were invited uh, but declined to join us this evening. But reading these two reports together on uh, the, the Hoovers and uh, Union of Concerned Scientists and following the debate that this statement has generated raises some challenging questions that I hope we can get into tonight. And here are a couple of them. Is the politicization of science by this administration different in degree or kind from that of past administrations? Is it possible to, to divorce science from politics in a world where the government funds the lion's share of scientific research and scientists increasingly have their own interests? 
Is it perhaps a pipe dream to think there exists such a thing as impartial value neutral science that can decide policy questions about the environment or public health? In the debates over these issues, where does science leave off, or where should science leave off, and values or politics begin? And since science, scientists frequently disagree, how are we to deal with scientific dissent and uncertainty in policymaking? And lastly, since the one thing people on both sides of the political divide seem to agree on is that the present system is broken and that science has become badly politicized in this country, what steps might we take to change things to imagine a new and socially useful role for science in helping us make the critical decisions that face us. Brief word about format before I turn it over to our panelists. I've asked each of them to speak for a few minutes, and no more than 10, um, on the abuse of science in their specific areas of expertise and experience. So if you'd please welcome Kurt Gottfried, Bruce Buckheit, Andrew Eller, David Baltimore, and David Gustin, and we will start with Kurt Gottfried. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I am not going to uh, speak about any cases that I've personally experienced. I'm the chairman of the Union of Concerned Scientists. I don't work for the government. Uh, but some of the other people here will be able to do that. Uh, some of the things I was going to say have already been said. Uh, so I will cut my talk down even further. Uh, so what clearly has prompted this meeting is the attitude, the alarming attitude of our government towards what I would call scientific knowledge. What we are seeing would have, would have astounded the founding fathers, especially Jefferson and Franklin. The founders' mental outlook was shaped by the great discoveries of science in the 18th century. And it is well known to historians that their mental outlook shaped by science had a significant role in the construction of the, of, of the Constitution. Today, our government often constructs policy to please constituents who believe that the Old Testament provides a valid description of evolution. The other day, I just, just a couple of days, I read that bookstores in national parks now offer a book for sale that gives an explanation of the formation of the Grand Canyon uh, according to, the, to Genesis, done in six days. So what we see here are deep things. I think these are not trivial things done just by a few people at the top of our government. Uh, we see a conflict on the one hand of a society which is ever more dependent on the products of science and perhaps for that very reason, I'm not sure I understand this, but there seems to be an increasing resistance to accepting the meaning of science. So what concerns me really is, is that at the top of our, is not what, just what happens at the top of our government, but that what happens at the top of our government reflects deep trends in our society. And these trends will continue long after this election is over. And I think those of us in the scientific community especially should prepare ourselves for a long campaign to convince our fellow citizens that while everyone is entitled to their own opinion, people are not entitled to their own facts. And that, and that nature, the laws of nature cannot be repealed by Congress or the White House. <clears throat> now, I would say that it is very clear, contrary to what some people may say, that the pattern that we've seen in this administration is unprecedented. If you, we see cases, let me just quickly list, in the departments of agriculture, energy, health and human services, interior, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the CIA. That's what led to the statement that you just was referred to and that I won't describe now. <coughs> uh, it is really quite remarkable that, say, astronomers will sign a statement which has nothing to do with astronomy per se, but uh, because the abuse is not of their field, but the abuses that we are concerned about are infractions of the ethics of science, and that unites people in all the scientific disciplines. Uh, I've been in involved for a long time in protests about government policies, but they've usually been specific to a particular policy, for example, Star Wars policy. But biologists didn't sign on to criticize Star Wars. 
it's, so we're seeing something quite different, and it is unprecedented. And the reason it's unprecedented, contrary to what people may have said in some institution or other, is that it is new. The first Bush administration had an exemplary policy on science. We didn't see anything like this in the first Bush administration or, for that matter, in the Nixon administration or the Reagan administration. It's true that all uh, the things we've seen have here and there happened in other administration, but not with this prevalence or this intensity or in, in this multitude. So let me just quickly talk about two examples. Uh, one may not be so familiar to you. It concerns nuclear weapons. It's an example of the tampering by the government with scientific advisory committees, of which there has been quite a bit. After the debacle at Los Angeles, the Wen Ho Lee case, Cong uh, that I'm sure you all know about, Congress created uh, a new Department of Energy agency with the wonderful name of the National Nuclear Security Administration, NNSA. It, it formed also with NNSA and a, a scientific advisory committee compa composed of very distinguished people, including two now from Berkeley, Raymond Jeanloss and Steve Chu, the new director of uh, LBL, and Sidney Drell from Stanford, and other very prominent people, including uh, a former Air Force chief of staff and this, you know, senior, I think, a former director of Livermore. Uh, when the administ Bush administration came in, it abolished this committee. It claimed that it was allowed to abolish this committee because it had a two-year tenure and therefore uh, had fulfilled its charge. Actually, it hardly ever met once the Bush administration came to office. In fact, when Congress established this committee, it was established as a permanent committee. Now, why was this committee abolished? Well, hearsay quickly developed that Drell and Gene Loss had published articles, uh, op-eds, explaining that one of the administration's pet programs to develop nuclear bunker busters didn't make sense because such bunker busters would not be surgical weapons, but would, if they were going to do the job they were supposed to do, would create a lot of fallout and what's you know collateral damage and could not be used in the way that was purported. There was nothing new about this. You can find that stated, in, stated by statements out of the nuclear weapons labs. But a more, re uh, probably a stronger reason for this having happened came out later, quite a bit later, after our report, uh, after our first report came out uh, last spring, and that is that uh, there was an inquiry through the Freedom of Information Act which discovered that the committee had uh, written a report which criticized two important uh, policies that are important to this administration, the first being exactly these bunker busters, and the other to see, uh, that was supposed to expedite the readiness of the Nevada test site for nuclear tests. And uh, it's presumably this kind of advice that they simply did not want to hear. There now is no independent scientific committee in the government uh, uh, related to, science, to nuclear weapons. I'll just quickly pass over the climate change thing. I, I do want to stay within my time. Uh, you probably all know that uh, the president uh, campaigned uh, 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 in his campaign in 2000 made it clear that he was opposed to the Kyoto Accord, and he has uh, he has certainly not uh, and he's he's used a sort of public relations policy which has emphasized the uncertainties in climate projections and in doing that he ha the administration has systematically distorted the knowledge that has been produced the the, the information that has been produced by the climate com uh, expert community including a panel of the National Academy of Sciences uh, to uh, that, uh, a panel that was formed at his request. And just the other day, in the no October 1st issue of Science Magazine, where the two candidates for the presidency were asked a bunch of questions about science policy, one of them concerned climate change, and there again, there is a distortion of the report by the National Academy, which only talks about the uncertainties and does not say what the Academy report did, is that there is evidence that human activity is contributing to climate change. That was not mentioned in that response at all. Now, uh, 
what are our concerns? There's first of all a practical concern, which I think is very important, and that is that we, in investigating all these uh, incidents that have been mentioned, that will be mentioned, have discovered that there is, a, uh, not surprisingly, that there's a great deal of uh, demoralization going on in scientific staffs inside the government. I think it's very important that people should recognize that we have some really outstanding scientific organizations in this government. These took decades to create. If these people are demoralized and start leaving, it will be very hard to reconstitute these institutions. Uh, because you will not be able to attract new blood, and if you lose the best people to, as in one case you'll hear from one tonight, uh, that really does serious damage to our uh, welfare, national welfare. Now, let me finish by saying uh, that the government, we scientists understand that scientific advice cannot dominate, determine public policy. There are many factors that enter public policy, of which science is, is usually only one factor. And it is the responsibility of elected officials to weigh all these things, including science, in making their decisions. What we expect from them is that science is, is weighed in an objective manner. It may be superseded by economic considerations or other considerations, but it is dangerous for the government to distort the scientific input into its decisions and uh, just to support a preconceived agenda. And what is perhaps even worse is to misrepresent the science when it's advocating its policies to the public. Now, I used the word dangerous there. Why is it dangerous? There's the obvious danger that it might lead to policies that are futile and expensive and even counterproductive. But I think there's a deeper danger. The deeper gain danger is that if a policy is guided by an ideology, that requires a rejection of reality. And a government that is not in touch with reality can, in the long run, only be maintained by adopting an ever more authoritarian form of government. Thank you. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen and students. <laughs> It's always refreshing to leave the Washington Beltway and come out here to what we refer to as the left coast. <laughs> um, I started out by, and by the way, I'll have to confess that it's going to be difficult for me to hang in on to the 10 minutes. I'm going to try. Um, but I started out on the right path, earning a bachelor's and master's degree in physics, but then I went awry and became a lawyer. So it is going to be difficult for me to hang in on those 10 minutes. Uh, I spent my career, I started as a part-time employee in the federal government under Richard Nixon, and then as a full-time lawyer uh, with the government uh, under Gerald Ford. So I've got 31 years uh, in the government, uh, moving up the, uh, the ranks, uh, operating on the, the interstices of science and law. Uh, because of my background, I was fortunate enough to uh, land in a bunch of jobs where I could put both skill sets to use and really get involved in, in litigating and, and uh, lawyering some of the uh, most important technical issues that arose at, uh, along the way. Um, I spent the first 10 years doing auto safety work and then moved over to the environment, senior counsel with the environmental enforcement section of the Justice Department, which was EPA's lawyer. And then uh, after 12 years, I was asked to come on over to EPA to manage EPA's Air Enforcement Division. And after a year or two in that job, um, we had shifted the organization around from uh, basically chasing nuisance actions to doing some really strategic work. And it was our shop that put together the cases against the coal-fired power plants and the refineries under the new source review provisions. Those cases, if allowed to proceed naturally, uh, would have reduced SO2 emissions in this country by half, I think about 5 million tons, and a similar number, maybe uh, half again, but about a million tons for NOx. Uh, that would have saved this country um, scores of billions of dollars 
in health care costs and uh, probably, I think, 15,000 lives a year, uh, several hundred thousand asthma attacks avoided each year, and so on. Um, Prior to the advent of the Bush administration, uh, I had prided myself as a career bureaucrat, that's how I felt of myself, being apolitical. We watched the swings as Gerald Ford left and Jimmy Carter came in and then Carter came in and Reagan and then Bush won and then um, Clinton. And you would have 10 or 20 degree swings in terms of, of emphasis. Um, but I can echo what's been said earlier tonight. The change under the Bush II administration is truly unprecedented. And the difference I would take on it is not so much abuse of science, but non-use of science. The Bush administration showed up in January and within three months came out with their national energy policy directives. They knew all of the answers without consulting anybody in the federal government, any of the experts had been on the ground, they knew enforcement against coal-fired power plants is bad, NSR is bad, anything to do with refineries is bad. Um, so they set out to do these NSR reforms. Uh, and there's a compare and contrast that I can do here. I think the, the, the bottom line when you look at what the Bush administration does is one, it ignores science, until it needs science. It sets a low level of proof for any action that it wants to take to help industry and sets a very high level of proof for any action that might be underway that would protect the public interest. And I'm going to give some examples of this. The first example is this NSR reform provision which exempts coal-fired power plants from uh, the modification rules under the Clean Air Act. It exempts them from the obligation to put on good controls at the time that they make substantial modifications. What's the justification for this sweeping change in the rules? The rules have been on the books since 1977 and they had worked reasonably well except for the fact that the uh, enforcement had fallen down. Well, you have a collection of anecdotes GAO has observed this, EPA's Inspector General has observed this, the National Academy of Public Administrators have observed this, and I'm here to tell you that this is also the case. All you have in support of these sweeping changes is a handful, maybe six complaints from people who are subject to enforcement actions saying they didn't like this, or this discouraged me from making this, that, or the other change. There is no science involved. There's no detailed analysis of the impacts on the economy, on jobs, on the environment, or even whether there's a, a, a global problem in the program. It is simply a few anecdotes. At, at EPA, we describe this as a faith-based initiative. <laughs> okay? Why? If you go to the parts of the rulemaking document where you're supposed to see the technical justification, each paragraph starts out, we believe. Okay. Contrast this with the, the rulemaking on mercury. On mercury, the chemistry is very well understood. It's, it's elemental chemistry. Nothing fancy about it. Most of the control technologies that would be employed to control mercury have been around for 20 plus years. Okay, wet flue glass desulfurization has been stocked for 20 or 30 years. The full scale tests of that technology where employed show 98% removal of mercury. Okay, this is on eastern coals. There are some issues with respect to western coals. You might only be able to get to 90%. You might have to employ carbon absorption or some other technologies that again are well understood it's not even a science issue, it's an engineering issue where the engineers will have to go out and look at each plant and decide which of the available technologies are, um, you know, the cheapest to employ to get you to the goal. But what does the administration say? It says, we can't do this. Why? Well, not all of the power plants and I, I, I have to struggle to get this right because it's, it's so illogical, have put on the controls, okay? In the West, nobody has put on 
carbon absorption. Right. Nobody will until somebody passes a law making them do it. The way the environmental regulation in this country has gone since the beginning, if you think about catalytic converters in cars, is scientists examine what's feasible, determine what's feasible, make recommendations to policymakers, and then the policymakers set a target for the industry, give them several years to do it, perhaps a, um, an escape hatch if necessary, and you tell them to go do it. What this administration is saying, since we're now in an area where we're protecting the public interest, is that we don't have enough proof that all of these technologies will work in all of the plants. And so we need to wait till 2015 or 2017. Um, when it comes to um, their Clear Skies proposal or the their new, new Clean Air Implementation Rule, they acknowledge that if you control emissions from power plants, you will save, I think their latest number is $110 billion a year in avoided health care costs. No dispute on that science. Why can't we do it now? Why can't we do it in five years, as Senator Jeffords bill would have required? Well, here we cast about for a variety of excuses or arguments, but again, no science. First argument, out of the box, there aren't enough welders in America to build these boxes. Okay, EPA seriously put this out there, all right? They sent EPA staff off to do a study to try to show that there aren't enough welders. Well, that sort of fell apart because if you think about it, it takes two years to get through vocational school and you can have as many welders as you want. So what's the new answer? Today's answer, and, and, and you go to the rulemaking documents and you can see it. They say there isn't present capacity within the industry that builds pollution control devices to do this stuff sooner. Let's break this down and decode it. Okay, it sounds like something. I don't know what they're saying. It sounds like something. If you decode it, what they're saying is, in order to do it sooner, we'd have to create more manufacturing jobs in this country. <laughs> Help me here. <laughs> One minute, Bruce. Okay, my last point is the control of information and decision making at the White House. I was on a panel recently uh, where Russell Train was present. He was a uh, senior fellow at EPA during the Nixon administration. He remarked that during his whole time, um, the White House got involved and asked one question. And once they were told that, that the industry's concerns had been considered but rejected, uh, the White House was out of it. This White House is involved in every aspect of every major decision and even many, many minor decisions that EPA is involved with. Um, I know this because I sat there and watched the debates go on. Um, on, the, on the Mercury Rule in particular, our office is supposed to look at these proposals before they go out the door. Uh, I knew that the proposal was supposed to be coming out in December, late October. I called my counterpart in the rulemaking shop and said, hey, Bill, you know, when am I going to get this package to look at? And his comment to me was, don't look at me, Bruce. I haven't gotten the numbers from the White House yet. Okay, so EPA professional staff are not designing these packages. They're not being consulted. Um, it, it's totally political and totally under the control of the White House. Thanks. Up next is uh, Andrew Eller, who, has, as Orville said, is still working for the government in the Fish and Wildlife Service, and it's uh, it's very courageous for him to be here talking about his em employer under those circumstances. Andy Eller. Thank you and good evening. I, I want to thank the University of California School of Journalism for hosting this event along with the Union of Concerned Scientists. I have been employed with the Fish and Wildlife Service for 18 years, um, involved primarily in land management. Uh, land acquisition 
and most recently development review. And the story I'm about to tell you is very similar to those of the other panelists. When you hear the name Florida, the first thing you may think of is Disney World, that fantasy land where everything is possible. But what you may not know is that there is another purveyor of fantasy in Florida, and that is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Vero Beach Field Office. <laughs> they have spun this elaborate fairy tale that the Florida panther is not threatened with extinction. They would like you to believe that there is a surplus of panthers and that we should not be concerned about habitat loss. In fact, the Florida panther is the only population of mountain lion remaining east of the Mississippi River in the United States. And <clears throat> there were fewer than 30 animals in 1995. A crossbreeding program using closely related Texas cougars has increased those numbers to about 90 in less than 10 years. So we've gotten them through a genetic bottleneck. But the population is not yet able to sustain itself. The primary threat now is habitat loss because land's important to the survival of the panther are being developed one and a half times faster than they can be protected. My job with the Fish and Wildlife Service was to assess the impacts of development on the Florida panther. I would evaluate relevant information and write a document called a biological opinion and determine whether or not a proposed project would jeopardize the continued existence of the species. On May 5th, 2004, I filed a Data Quality Act complaint against my own agency and charged them with using and disseminating information that lacked utility, information that lacked integrity, and that was not objective. I filed this Data Quality Act complaint with the help of PEER, the Public Employees for Environmental Responsibility. One problem with the science is that we were equating and daytime habitat use patterns of the Florida panther when it, when it is at rest with nighttime habitat use patterns when it is most active. This caused a lot of problems um, during permit review in accurately assessing the impacts of development on Florida panther habitat. A second problem is that the agency was assuming that all adults were breeders when in fact many only bred irregularly, some were too old to breed, some too young to breed, and others were geographically isolated and could not find a mate, and still others were just simply reproductively unfit. A third problem is that the agency used inflated population estimates, reproductive rates, and kitten survival rates to characterize the status of the species. Now let's take a closer look at how some of this science was used. In December of 2001, I was told under threat of insubordination to modify a biological opinion and incorporate information that stated there was a surplus of panthers and that we should not be, con and that the cumulative effects of habitat loss were of no consequence. In June of 2003, the National Wildlife Federation filed a lawsuit against the Fish and Wildlife Service and alleged that they had acted in an arbitrary and capricious manner in writing the biological opinion. In August of 2004, a federal judge ruled in favor of the environmental group and stated in, in his conclusion that the agency failed to articulate a rational connection between a record of facts and it's no jeopardy decision on the project. Now, there are standards for the ethics and conduct of Fish and Wildlife Service employees, but the agency has never prescribed penalties if those standards are violated, and I think they should do so. Ironically, the field office supervisor, a key decision maker in the case history I just gave you, is in training for a promotion to upper level management, where he will continue to, to do the same things that he is doing now. There has been no internal agency review. Uh, there has not been an investigation by the Inspector General for the Department of Interior. Nor has there been um, a review by Congress, although there has been uh, one letter of inquiry written by a senator. 
the issue of whether or not the panther is at jeopardy has been highly debated within the agency for over a decade. And many biologists before me have tried and failed to make the case. But under previous presidential administrations, at least management would listen to the case presented by the biologist. If they disagreed, they would say so. Although they wouldn't always give the reason why they disagreed. The difference between this presidential administration and previous administrations is significant. In 2001, the field office supervisor in Vero Beach told staff that the office would not write Jeopardy biological opinions. And this is significant because our office covers 19 South Florida counties and 68 threatened and endangered species, some of which are actually more imperiled than the Florida panther. There's no acceptable reason for making a statement like that. Proper administration of the Endangered Species Act requires the agency to write a Jeopardy biological opinion if the facts support the conclusion. Since 2001, the Vero Beach Field Office has actively inserted false and erroneous information into its biological opinions and removed factual information to paint a fairy tale story about the status of the Florida panther. And this kind of behavior could only occur under a presidential administration where the Secretary of Interior is openly hostile to the Endangered Species Act and the President is openly hostile towards science. The story that I've just given you is what's going on in Vero Beach. But there are many Fish and Wildlife Service offices throughout the United States. I don't know what's going on in those offices, but we're going to find out. Uh, PEER, the Public Employees for Environmental Responsibility, in conjunction with the Union of Concerned Scientists, has prepared a survey for my colleagues. The results of that survey should give us a pretty good idea of how many other Fish and Wildlife Service offices are operating as branches of Disney World. Thank you. Next up, Next up is David Baltimore. Let me first say why I uh, signed on to the Union of Concerned Scientists document. Uh, I had found myself for months cataloging in, in my mind the number of situations in which science and independent advice was being ignored in Washington. And so when the Union put, to, put it all together in a single document, I was extremely grateful to them because they had done what I, what I had not myself had been able to do which was to put down on paper the uh, situation that was being uh, so well actually covered by the press on a day-to-day -day basis. There's no question that ignoring scientific findings or trying to pack scientific panels is more prevalent in this administration than any I have experienced. Uh, and you've, you've heard this from people who are much closer to it than I am. Uh, most recently, the administration is controlling who may speak at international scientific meetings, a form of control that I think is qualitatively new. The scientific community has historically run by principles that are being violated. The right to attend meetings, the right of meeting organizers to shape their own programs, defining for themselves who is an expert on a given topic. But the most serious problem is that the accepted scientific findings of our community are being ignored in making policy. Before the US UCS report came out, I think the administration felt that it were, they were able to manipulate findings by selective quotation of the literature or simply avoid mentioning unpleasantries. Uh, the UCS report has had a salutary effect of causing the, the uh, government uh, to be, a, I think, a little more honest about what science says, but there's still a complete disconnect between the science and the policy. The most serious issue to my mind is our response to the AIDS epidemic. It's most serious because it is now killing more people, the AIDS epidemic is killing more people 
than any other infectious disease in the world, and it is spreading at an accelerating rate. In the United States, we have a relatively low level but continuing spread with about 40,000 new cases each year. But abroad, that number is 5 million a year, something like 10,000, more than 10,000 a day. This infection is devastating Africa. It's spreading to Asia, where China, India, and Southeast Asia are all seeing increased rates of infection. Now, if this was any other virus infection, we would now have a vaccine for it, and we would be fighting its spread by immunization. But HIV is not like other viruses, and all attempts to produce a vaccine have failed thus far, and there is literally no successful vaccine on the horizon. We still have no idea if we can produce a vaccine, in fact, but we certainly don't expect to find a vaccine for at least a decade. And that's a sad thing to say because we've been saying that same thing for 20 years. Lacking a vaccine, what do we have? We only have methods of prevention by the education of individuals. HIV is spread by sex and needle sharing, and these are behaviors that are under human control. So what is needed is intensive education. And it is possible to lower the spread of the virus through education, as shown in Thailand and Uganda. There have been many studies of what works and what doesn't work. The formula under which uh, policy is set is called the ABC formula, abstinence, be faithful, and use condoms. And the A and B are fine, but they're a hard sell to truck drivers away from their families or young men whose culture says they have the right to demand sex from young women. What works and what has been shown to work in many studies is condoms. They're not perfect. They must be used with some care. But the constant message that we get from the federal government today is that condoms are ineffective. They don't say they're not effective at all, but they keep emphasizing, very much what one of the other speakers said, emphasizing the degree of uncertainty rather than saying this is the best we have and we have to go with it. Problem is that condoms are associated with birth control and that artificial means of birth control is unacceptable to our present government. It is a clear case, to my mind, of religious beliefs driving public policy in the face of both dire need and established fact. We see three consequences. Removal of funding for programs that emphasize condom use, funding of programs that preach abstinence, especially those that are faith-based, and concentration of effort on treating those who are infected rather than on prevention. Now, the latter is, in a way, the most insidious thing because it's a cynical approach to focus entirely on the treating infected people and not putting, uh, pre not putting emphasis on the important role of prevention so that people don't become infected. And even then, the government is pandering to the American drug companies by not allowing funds to be used to purchase cheaper generic drugs so more people can take advantage of it. So that's one area. I want to discuss another area, which comes in many ways to the same conclusion. Uh, ignoring the advice of the scientific community, in this case, the medical community, and even the patient community. And the policy is stem cell research. We've known for years that all tissues in the bodies of animals arise from stem cells, and that in the very early embryo, there are stem cells that can give rise to all the elements of the body. That has to be true because we all come from a fertilized egg. Uh, we learned about, uh, actually quite a long while ago, to culture these cells from mice uh, and to make permanent cell lines from which uh, tissues of, of a mature sort can be derived. And something like 10 years ago, we learned how to grow human embryonic stem cells. Now, to do this requires that the cells be taken from a recently fertilized egg. But the whole procedure can be carried out in vitro with no chance for the embryo to develop into a recognizable fetus because 
it is not implanted into a uterus. Now, there's a second way to make embryonic stem cells, and that involves transplanting a nucleus of an adult cell into an egg. And this is akin to what can be done for in, in, in the process of cloning an animal. Both attempts of producing embryonic stem cells are opposed on religious grounds by people who have influence in Washington and therefore government-funded stem cell research is artificially restricted to a few cell lines and nuclear transfer is not allowed. Again, cynically I think, opponents of the research try to argue that there's a different cell that can do the job. It's called an adult stem cell in, and they argue it can be used in the place of embryonic stem cells. Now, it is true that adult stem cells are useful, but they're not a substitute for embryonic stem cells. Opponents also argue that we do not know that embryonic stem cells are useful for any particular purpose. There is no therapy yet based on the use of embryonic stem cells. That is true. But of course, only by free and unfettered research will we be able to discover what the utility is. And so arguing that we don't know what the utility is is certainly not an argument against doing stem cell research. It's an argument for it. I think we should note here that the state of California has taken matters into its own hands. And there's a ballot proposition in the election, uh, Proposition 71, to fund research in California from bond funds over a 10-year period, almost $300 million a year. This could be extremely valuable for science and even potentially if it works out well for the economy of the state. Uh, but it's a desperation move on the part of people, particularly on the part of, of, the, child, of the parents of children who have diseases that could one day potentially be treated by stem cells. In their desperation, they have turned to a bond issue, to a, to a uh, modification of the California um, Constitution. Um, and they shouldn't have been driven to that. We have in Washington a very fine funding agency that should be in the business of making things happen rather than preventing them from happening. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, before I'm walking here from the uh, reception, one of the other panelists asked me if I was going to be the right wing of this panel, um, because after hearing the descriptions of things that are going on, in some panels there might actually be a response, and I was at, I was at a, uh, a panel very much like this at Harvard Medical School, where structurally the person in this position on the panel was in fact the uh, the defender of the right wing here, and my response was no, I'm I'm not the right wing of this panel, but I may be the counterintuitive left wing of the panel, um, but we'll see what happens. And in my remarks, I certainly do not want to trivialize the real abuse that government scientists and advisors have been subject to, and I certainly don't want to align myself. Uh, against the ABCs of, uh, of HIV control and so forth. But I want to question the framing of this issue of the politicization of science. And one of the places that I've looked to to do this is, is something as sort of homely as the history of American film, where if you recall your Casablanca, uh, Louis, the Vichy prefect of police, shrilly shouts that he is shocked, shocked to find gambling going on at the back room of Rick's Cafe Americain, even as he's being handed several thousands in francs of winnings from the roulette wheel. And to some extent, the response of the scientific community to the allegations and the cataloging of these individual abuses has struck me very much in the same way, that there's a certain lack of recognition that the politicization has been happening 
all along. Now, it may be the case there are certain deviations in quality and kind, but science is shot through top to bottom with politics. The federal government this year will be spending about $130 billion of public money on research and development, a little bit more on the, on the defense side than on the civilian side. Um, and that's the, you know, sort of that's the, the large sketch of the politics, all the way down to the votes, and they are votes that tenure committees and dissertation committees have to decide who will be the succeeding generation of scientists. That's the top and the bottom and you can fill in the middle for yourself, that science is, in fact, shot through with politics, and that's its normal state of affairs. So the question that I want to ask, rather than is science politicized, is a different question entirely, but one that I think we can hopefully get to from uh, Michael's initial comments and some of the things that I heard from the other panelists, and that is, not is science, is science politicized, but how can we democratize science? Now, what I mean by democratization is not, for example, settling questions about nature by plebiscite any more than the democratization of politics would require the setting of the prime rate by referendum. But what I mean is first creating institutions and practices that fully incorporate sets of values that we hold political institutions to when we think about them as being democratic, including accessibility, transparency, and accountability. And we should think about scientific institutions and science policy institutions the same way that we think about political institutions in that regard. Second, by considering the societal outcomes of research just as thoroughly and attentively as we consider the scientific and technical outputs. And what I mean here is that when we usually go and look at the successes of the scientific enterprise and we think about making priorities for research funding and we think about evaluating the portfolios of universities or individual scientists or departments or whatnot, we look at what bureaucrats might call the outputs of the research, the first initial stage where they have produced a paper or they have graduated a student. The agenda that I would like to encourage would be one that looked beyond that toward looking at the societal outcomes, the things in society that the science is promised to affect, the health of the public, the economic growth, the opportunities, the broader intellectual contributions. For example, with the National Institutes of Health, you might get an exceedingly different portfolio if you started backward from what are the major causes of disease and how do we get them and work your way backward to set an agenda than if you start from an agenda that says what are the interesting disciplinary problems, what are scientists interested in working on. Third, insisting that science, in addition to being rigorous, is also popular, relevant, and participatory. And what I mean by this is that there are a variety of ways of encouraging the participation of stakeholders and lay citizens in decisions that we traditionally think of as scientific. And they range from inclusion either in individual peer review panels or adjunct panels. I'll give you one example of that. The National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitative Research is not one of the many National Institutes of Health Institutes, but it's actually in the Department of Education. And it funds about $100 million of research every year, just at a level to stay below the radar of most political scrutiny. And one of the things that they do is they have two separate evaluation committees for the grant proposals that they receive. One is a, uh, a technical review committee, and the second is a stakeholder and citizen relevance review committee. And at least in my preliminary research with the folks at NIDRR, this seems to work fairly well for them, even to the point where um, they get a proposal, and this was one of the examples told to me, uh, they get a proposal for uh, an amazingly uh, the development of an amazingly sort of high-tech uh, cane 
to assist the visually impaired. That scores tremendously well on the uh, technical review. And then when it goes to the relevance review, the representatives from the visually impaired community say, well, our canes work very well. Thank you. Please put the money towards something that we find more relevant. Um, the suggestion there is not necessarily that there should be a populist veto over the scientific agenda, but that there are better ways of constructing the scientific agenda that we have now that involve collaboration among the scientists who are performing the work and the rest of us who will be uh, exposed to the results of that research. Um, and simply in terms of style of presentation, sort of going back to the, the question of the sincerity of the discovery of this politicization of science, um, one of the reasons I turn toward this agenda of democratization is because it seems to me that without coming up with a constructive agenda in response, um, rather than one that looks like, well, simply leave us scientists alone and away from politics and we'll do the job, um, you're left with a situation there where scientists who give that response can simply be portrayed as the same kind of, um, if you will, and you know this is a, a provocative word, but the same kind of uh, malcontents that scientific that the scientific community frequently portrays those scientists who are in the minority among scientific disputes. That is, it opens up a political framing of the debate over the politicization of science, such that the scientific community can become marginalized in the same way that scientific disputes open up the possibility that portions of the scientific community become marginalized. And that's where I want to stop. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're going to leave it right there. I want to thank our panel for... Um And thank you all for coming. Thank you all very much for coming and putting up with the heat. <laughs>